Before I learned how to read, my mother would read to my siblings and me before bed. We'd all cozy up in and around mother's lap on a big overstuffed chair. She read to us about a boy who ran away to live by himself in a hollowed out tree in the Catskill Mountains. She read about a boy who was a stowaway on a ship at sea and how he was discovered by the ship's friendly cook and made to work for his keep. I learned words like flotsam and jetsam, fore and aft and peregrine falcon, the smell of seawater and diesel, or the faraway sound of a hawk in a silent forest can still make my eyes well with tears. But then I went to school and they tried to teach me to read about purple turtle and green kitten and other such boring nonsense. In school, the big world turned out to be nothing like living in a hollowed out tree smelling of campfire or being on a big ship at sea smelling of fish and foamy brine. School smelled like urine and rubber cement. Rubber cement that a kid I knew in middle school sniffed until the jar was empty. He told me it made him see blue diamonds. This was the mind-numbing, nausea, and headache-inducing kind of adventure school had in store for me. I remember my first day of kindergarten. The school was across the street from my house, so I stepped out of the classroom onto the fire escape and saw my mom sweeping our front porch. I felt the way a dog must feel when it realizes a ride in the car has ended at the vet because I called out to my mom from the fire escape, but my voice was tiny and lost on a sea of noise like a little boat tossed, not on an adventure that I would have chosen, but just lost in a crowd of noisy kids. And somehow all of these kids seemed better than me in every way. They all seemed to know what was going on and what to do. But I still thought they were idiots because they seemed to actually like being in school. I liked being alone, feeling proud of what I could do without having to compare it to anyone else. Being in school made me do things I didn't want to do and things I wasn't good at. And I was only good at imagining being good at something. I soon learned the main lesson of kindergarten. It's good to be sick. To be sick was to stay home and get care and attention. I loved the sound of the vacuum cleaner and soap operas and game shows. I loved being at home with my own imagination, comforting myself with the smell of my own farts and impressing myself with my ridiculous little achievements that no one would ever recognize as achievements. I wrote my first book at this time. All but two or three of the pages were blank, but it had a lot of pages and that made it feel like an achievement. In first grade, the lessons from school came thick and fast. I learned that certain girls can be mysteriously attractive, able to send you into daydreams that make you forget everything else. While I was gazing at my first true love at age six, I just peed and I let it pool on my chair and trickle to the floor. The only one who noticed this was the girl because she knew I was staring at her. She went to the teacher and said, he's staring at me and he peed his pants. The teacher simply gave me some paper towels and sent me to the nurse to get a clean pair of pants. The humiliation taught me to be more careful. But in second grade, I learned that peeing my pants was nothing 
compared to the humiliations that would follow. Miss Geiter, my second grade teacher, taught me that beautiful women can be especially vicious and cruel. Here's how that went. I was always a magnet for misfits in school. This is because although I appear to be a loner off in a world of my own, if you approach me, you'll find out I am gracious and kind. So every troubled, weird, rubber cement sniffing misfit eventually finds his way to me, like a stowaway finds the ship's friendly cook. David Connell was one such misfit who attached himself to me. He was, at seven years old, fixated on blood and gore, very likely a young serial killer in the making. Once, he traced his hand on paper, then scribbled red ink on the fingers and wrote above it, Bloody Fingers, spelled B-L-D-Y-F-N-G-R-S, Bloody Fingers, with no vowels. He put the paper on my desk, and Miss Geiter saw it, thinking it was my work. She picked up the paper and snarled at me, baring her perfectly white she-dog teeth, and said, and this is an exact quote, You are a hideous monster, and if you don't know what that means, look it up. Well, I didn't need to look it up. I already knew those words. And while I had the early suspicion that I didn't fit in at school and would rather be at home smelling my own farts, the beautiful Miss Geiter awakened me to the reality that I wasn't just a misfit magnet, but I was myself a hideous misfit. Well, it was time to get with the program and learn what they call in teacher's college socially constructed reality. One day, Miss Geiter drove this point home by teaching the class that clouds are like fluffy cotton balls and that we needed to reinforce this lesson by pasting cotton balls onto construction paper. I raised my hand and said respectfully, Clouds are like fog. My family drove into a cloud on Mount Washington and it was just like fog. We even have a bumper sticker that says, this car climbed Mount Washington. I was very proud. But for some reason, this was also hideous to Miss Geiter. And she made me sit on the dummy stool that she had placed in front of the whole class where her second graders could learn obedience by being made an object of horror and public derision. Well, I learned that if the teacher says clouds are cotton, then just call them cotton. The best I can say after 50 years of thinking this over is that I challenged her authority. So the moral of the story for me was, get in line, keep your head down, and don't be smart. By third grade, my education began to escalate. My third grade teacher was the liberated Ms. Prell. She understood her job to be not so much teaching children, but actually saving the world. She trained young activists for the social crusades of the 1970s. I'd already been indoctrinated into the cottony cloud theory. So under Ms. Prell's indoctrination on what we used to call ecology, I formulated my own theory that pollution is like someone dumping a giant garbage can on the earth. I drew a picture of this and I was praised. I was getting good at getting with the program. Compliance gets praise. Non-compliance gets humiliation. Now I was ready to shout any slogan Chairwoman Prell had in her little red book. In fact, one assignment was to write our own slogan, or poem, as she called it. And I still remember mine 
and I cringe when I think of it, and I cringe that I still remember it. Women want their equal rights. They won't give up without a fight. These were the days of Virginia Slims, cigarettes for liberated women, because you've come a long way, baby. They were also the days of America's most notorious bigot, Archie Bunker. Not coincidentally, at this time, my mother had also cultivated an antagonistic attitude towards men. She would occasionally go on a rant about some example of patriarchal oppression while glowering down at me with a wagging finger, as if I was an eight-year-old male chauvinist pig in training. For all its supposed perks and oppressive power, I wasn't so sure being a man was going to be all it was cracked up to be. The most important lesson from all of that in third grade was that complex issues can and must be reduced to slogans. You must quickly take the side of the angels. Do not attempt your own analysis, because if you do, the beautiful people will put you on the dummy stool and everyone will laugh at you. They'll call you Archie Bunker. Their power is the power to shame you. Who holds the power to shame holds the greatest of all powers. But on the bright side, you can join the popular kids if you have the correct beliefs. Finally, I come to the most memorable teacher in my elementary school years. Memorable in small part because I had her for both fourth and fifth grade, but in large part because she was a loud, pushy bully. Her name was Beverly Bardwell, and she had 1950-style bobbed hair and cat glasses. She wore a white short-sleeved shirt with a vest and slacks. She usually had a pack of cigarettes rolled up in her shirt sleeve. Amazing how times have changed. I realized later why adults rolled their eyes when Bev Bardwell's name came up. It wasn't because she was abusing nine and ten-year-olds. No one seemed to care too much about that. It was because she was obviously a lesbian, affecting a tough dyke persona. Now, I knew nothing of lesbians or anything like that. I only knew she was crude, mean, and petty. Everything Miss Bardwell said had a sharp hook in it. Like when I returned for fifth grade wearing glasses, she said, oh good, you got glasses. Maybe now you'll be able to do math. <laughs> it was about that time that I showed her my 1939S Mercury Head Dime. She said, oh, where'd you get that? And she didn't wait for me to explain. She just said, I'd better keep that safe in my desk so you don't spend it in the cafeteria. Well, I tried to say I wouldn't spend it, but my voice was only a squeak. I believed my collector's item coin was being kept safe in her desk. That day passed, no mention of my dime. Another day passed. Another week, a couple weeks, and one day I got the courage to ask Miss Bardwell, could I have my dime back? She said, what? Oh, that. I took that home. No further explanation. No replacement dime. I was as confused as I was hurt. I mean, it's unimaginable that a teacher would steal something from you. And my mother didn't help. I don't think she believed a teacher would do that. Just add that to the list of things parents didn't believe when their children told them. Well, I must have become sullen in my attitude toward Miss Bardwell because she smelled a whiff of resistance about me. One afternoon, she distributed a math worksheet I sat at my desk, ignoring the paper, staring out the window, dreaming of running away to the fort 
I had built in the woods that summer. Miss Bardwell's cold shadow came upon me suddenly, and she shouted, You! Out in the hall! The class collectively gasped and held its breath. The wrath of Bardwell was no joke. So with one fluid motion, my stomach sank and my rubbery legs lifted me off the chair, propelled me across the room and led me out the door. I stood shaking in the hall. The shadow of Bardwell appeared swiftly, saying, Look at me! I looked down at the green institutional linoleum. Passive aggression was the only defense within my power. Bev Bardwell, in her vest and white shirt with the smokes rolled up in the sleeve, grabbed both my shoulders hard and dug her sharp fingernails into my flesh. She jolted me once, snapping my head up to look into her cat glasses and thin, puckered, sphincter-like lips. She said these immortal words. What are you going to do with your life? <laughs> Remember, I was 10 years old. Well, tears flowed out of my 10-year-old eyes as I replied, I want to be a musician. What I really wanted to say was, here am I sitting in a tin can, far above the world. Planet Earth is blue, and there's nothing I can do. Miss Bardwell, I want to be a sexually ambiguous alien rock star like David Bowie. I want to be sexually ambiguous because I don't want to be a male chauvinist. I want to be an alien because it makes being a misfit mysterious and cool. And I want to be a rock star because he's a misfit who is loved and praised for what he loves to do and for what he's good at. <laughs> but of course, I said none of that. Miss Bardwell's lecture had something to do with how we need math no matter what we're going to do in life. Well, you know, that's true enough. But I didn't believe anything she said because she was a bully and a liar and a thief. If I were able to think things through, and I suppose I can be excused for not thinking it through at age 10, but I would have realized that the most important lesson in life would be learned quickly if I had tried to live alone in the woods or stow away on a ship at sea. That lesson is this. To get anything good, you have to do things that are hard. I don't think Miss Guider, Ms. Prell, or Miss Bardwell ever thought it through either. They were, like most adults, too busy thinking about how they wanted things to be. And they had very little interest in understanding things as they actually are. They should know. Of all people, they should know. If you find a little stowaway on your ship, treat him kindly and teach him how to work for his keep.